Living with uncertainty can take its toll. The normal day-to-day -day is replaced with fear, worry, doubt. When our normal is disrupted, our surroundings begin to feel weak. Foundations begin to rattle. Our lives become disoriented. As time goes on, we begin to lose sight of the one constant on our journey. Jesus. The fear is consuming. The worry, draining. The doubt, painful. Even in our darkest moments, when the last thread of hope has unraveled from our being, we must dwell on truth. We must remember, no matter what is happening around us, God is still sovereign. Today, let us dwell on the truth of Easter. The stone has been rolled away. The grave has been rendered powerless. Death has transformed to life. In our fear, He is still risen. In our worry, He is still victorious. In our doubt, He is still alive. When everything seems hopeless, the hope of Easter remains.
lived and died to buy my pardon an empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives because he lives I can fail but it didn't end at the cross. You rose again, giving us hope, giving a foundation to our faith. Oh God, we praise you and we glorify you this morning. Lord, let us walk in that faith. Let us walk in the confidence that you are the God of life. And you will bring life to us. Lord, I pray that we would walk in faith. That you are all that you say you are in your word. Lord, I just pray that our lives would be different, would be changed. As we grow in our understanding of you and we continue to, to 
take steps of faith to draw closer and closer. Lord, I pray that our lives would be changed and that the power of the resurrection would become evident flowing through us. Lord, would you be glorified through each one of us? Lord, whatever the struggle that we're going through right now, I pray that you would show us who you are in relation to that struggle. You are our provider. You're our healer. You're our counselor. You're our protector. You're our sustainer. You're the one who accomplishes what concerns me. Lord, you are the God of the universe, and yet you are a very, very personal God. You are the one who controls the events of not just our time in history throughout the world, but every time in history throughout the entire universe. And yet you say that you work all things together for good, for those who love you and who are called according to your purpose, each individual. Lord, thank you for that. Continue to build our faith. Help us to walk before you in confidence of who you are and help us to impact the world around us as a result. In Jesus' name.
After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, a rainbow resembling an emerald encircled around the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder. Before the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also before the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center around the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a face like a man. The fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under his wings. Day and night they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth, or under the earth, could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation you have made them to be a kingdom of priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth then I looked and heard a voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousand times ten thousand they encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders in a loud voice they sang Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped.
And why is he worthy? Because he went to the cross for you and for me. He bore the weight of our sin and shame. He died the death that we deserve, that we might live the life that we could never attain. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. But that's not the end of the story. On the third day, he rose again from the grave. He conquered sin and death and hell, never again to to be subjugated by their tyrannical rule. Instead, he reigns supreme, exalted in the highest heaven, seated at the right hand of God the Father as King of kings and Lord of lords, and ever present with us in the person of his Holy Spirit as comforter and counselor and friend. He, is he worthy to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing? We stand in agreement. He is. To him who sits on the throne and unto the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for joining our service stream this resurrection morning. We are Millard Alliance Church here in Omaha, Nebraska, and we are delighted that you could join us in celebration today. We've been walking through a series in the past few weeks called Essential Worship, drawn out of the fourth chapter of John and Jesus' encounter with the Samaritan woman at the well. We've seen how Jesus lays out for her what it means to truly worship God, what it means to worship in spirit and in truth, to hear God's voice and respond in faith, in simple obedience. The second week we saw in the life of this Samaritan woman how how her faith was put into action and how we are called to engage our world with his life-changing message, this message of the Messiah. Last week at his triumphal entry for Palm Sunday, we touched on the expectations that the crowd must have had and that we all bring into our relationship with Jesus. We looked at Mark chapter 11 in his triumphal entry. Today we examine in the resurrection of Jesus the three dimensions of essential worship that we see in John chapter 20. Let's pray together, shall we? O Lord Jesus, we desire to worship you this morning in spirit and in truth. It is true, you are worthy to receive all power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing from all of your created order and from my life as well. And Lord, to that end, would you open our spiritual eyes so we can see, open our spiritual ears so we might hear your truth for us from your word today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'm going to be reading out of the New American Standard Version this morning. I got to tell you, I love John's writing style. He frequently uses a Greek storytelling technique called the historical present, where he is writing about a past event, but he uses present tense verbs in order to draw us as the audience in to the action of the story. You can think about it this way. If I were to tell you a little story about what happened yesterday, a fictional story, yesterday I went to the store and there was an armed robber. He said to the clerk, give me all the money. And just then, a customer jumped on him from behind. Now that was all in 
past tense verbiage. But if we were to use the historical present, like John uses it in so frequently in his writings, both in his gospel and in his epistles, it would sound something like this. Hey, so yesterday, I go to the store, and there's this armed robber there, and he says to the clerk, give me all the money, and just then, the customer jumps him from behind. You see, those were present tense verbs set in the past, and it really draws us as the audience in to the story. It's a subtle but pervasive indicator that John really was an eyewitness to the accounts that he's sharing with us. So turn with me, if you will, to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. <clears throat> Unfortunately, most translations don't carry this technique over uh, into English. They translate them into their proper past tense verbs as they should be in proper English grammar. But the New American Standard Bible puts a little asterisk by every verb that is used in this way, uh, which is one of the reasons I really love reading and studying out of the NASB. So I'm going to read this chapter and try to include this sense of immediacy that John uses in his writing. John chapter 20, beginning in verse 1. Now, on the first day of the week... Mary Magdalene comes early to the tomb while it's still dark and she sees the stone already taken away from the tomb. And so she runs and, and comes to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and says to them, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth and the other disciple and they were going to the tomb and the two were running together. The other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter and, and came to the tomb first. And stooping in and looking in, he sees the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Simon Peter, therefore, also, he, he comes following him and entered the tomb. And he beholds the linen wrappings lying there. And the face cloth, which had been on his head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. So the other disciple who had come to the tomb entered then also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. So the disciples went away to their own homes. But Mary was standing outside the tomb, weeping. And so as she wept, she stooped and she looked into the tomb and she beholds two angels in white, one at the head and one at the feet where the body of Jesus had been laying. And they say to her, woman, why are you weeping? She says to them, because they've taken away my Lord and, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and, and she beholds Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus says to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she says to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have taken him, and I will take him away. Jesus says to her, Mary, she turns and says to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus says to her, Stop clinging to me, but go to my brethren and say to them, I, have as I, I ascend to my Father and your Father and my God and your God. Mary Magdalene comes announcing to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And that he had said all these things to her. When therefore it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came in and stood in their midst. And he says to them, Peace be with you. 
And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples therefore rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus therefore said to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them. And he says to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples, therefore, were saying to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see his hands and the imprint nails, and I put my finger into the place of the nails, and I put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again, his disciples were inside, and Thomas was with them. Jesus comes, the doors having been shut, and he stood in their midst, and he said, Peace. Be with you. Then he says to Thomas, Reach here your finger, see my hands, and reach here your hand, and put it into my side. And be not unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. Before we examine the three dimensions of worship that I'd like to pull out of this passage, we need to understand something about the biblical context. We get into theological trouble, some deep misunderstandings and misapplications when we try to superimpose modern definitions of English terms over ancient biblical text and context. Worship in the Bible is never spoken of as an inward, subjective experience. Like, wow, Gabriel, that worship was such an amazing experience. We don't read about or hear worship being talked about in that way in Scripture, as if the worship was an end in and of itself. Rather, the Bible always speaks of worship as an outward-oriented, objective practice. And the validity of our worship is wholly, completely dependent upon the object of our worship. Remember, from John chapter 4, a couple of weeks back, Jesus said to the woman at the well, A time is coming when you will worship but he didn't end his sentence there. He gave us the object of the worship. A time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Geography didn't matter to Jesus. True worshipers, he said, will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The primary importance in worship that Jesus conveys to the woman was the object of your worship. Not the location, not the form, but the Father. And second consideration is the condition of the heart of the worshiper. In spirit and in truth. We like to use terms in our everyday language when we're talking to people. Are you, are you a man of faith? Are, are you a worshiper? But really, we need to dig a little farther than that. Dig a little deeper. Who is your faith in? Or what do you put your faith in? And what exactly is it that you are worshiping? Or to whom do you worship? 
So in John chapter 20, we see three dimensions of essential worship with regard to the rightful object of our worship. That is the person of Jesus Christ. And each one of these also has a direct challenge to some deeply embedded cultural and religious norms that we are all steeped in in the human race. So let's begin to take a look. The first dimension of essential worship that I'd like to pull out of this passage in John chapter 20 is the dimension of Jesus as teacher. Look at verse 16. Mary is there at the tomb weeping. The men have already gone home. She remains. And in verse 16, Jesus says to her, Mary, she turned and says to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. The Greek word here is didaskalos. It means teacher of any kind, but most often, especially in the New Testament, uh, it is in reference to one who teaches spiritual truths or teaches things concerning the things of God and the duties of man toward God. A spiritual instructor. We see this in the confession of Peter in John chapter 6 when Jesus, after having a, a particularly difficult teaching time, difficult for the people to receive, that is, And a bunch of his followers turned their back and walked away. They said, this is too, too difficult. It's too much. Like, we can't take it. And Jesus turns and asks of his disciples, are you going to leave me too? And Peter responds, affirming Jesus' rightful position as teacher. His response was, to whom else shall we go? For you alone have the words of eternal life. Peter affirmed Jesus' position, this dimension of Jesus as teacher. We see the same approach in Mary's words here at the tomb. By ascribing to him the title teacher, Mary is positioning herself as a learner, a pupil, a disciple. The Greek for that is mathetes. It's the same picture we see of another Mary, Mary the sister of Martha and Lazarus, as she was sitting at the feet of Jesus, receiving instruction at Jesus' feet, right alongside the men. A disciple. Jesus as teacher. This brings Two challenges, both in the context and to us. The first challenge was to the religious establishment. Jesus, her, his position as teacher was one of rabbi. John Ortberg, in his book called Who is This Man? The Unpredictable Impact of the Inescapable Jesus he writes this, Rome had armies, Greece had culture, Egypt had wealth, Phoenicia had ships, Israel was the people of the book. And rabbis knew the book. When they taught it, they would cite great rabbis for the correct interpretation of the scriptures. They would say things like, and Rabbi Shammai says, but Rabbi Hillel says, this wasn't a sign of bad teaching, John Ortberg says. It's very much like in our day when a judge is going to make a ruling. We expect a good judge to cite precedents or decisions that have been made in the past. Jesus was a rabbi like other rabbis, but not like any other rabbi. You see, he didn't cite others. He said things like, truly, I say to you, and in the Gospel of John, 
He doubles down and he said it twice. Truly, truly, I say to you. John Ortberg says these words appear 75 times in the Gospels. And by this, Jesus positions himself as the authoritative source and teacher. And this was a direct challenge to the religious establishment of his day. Other teachers of scripture and students of the law remarked, he teaches with such authority. He's not citing other rabbis, Jesus, teacher, Rabboni. The second challenge that we see here is to the social norms. Everywhere Jesus goes and he encounters women in his New Testament gospel ministry, we see him confronting social norms and raising the status of women in their culture. Everywhere he goes, the Samaritan woman, the woman caught in adultery, the woman who reached out to touch the hem of his garment to be healed, and the many who ministered to him and with him in his ministry travels. He directly challenged the social norms, which said, no, women have no place in studying the teachings or sitting under the teachings of a rabbi. And Jesus said, no, you're welcome to sit at my feet and to learn of me. I'd like to challenge you to consider if your own personal religious establishment and your own personal social norms aren't being challenged by the teachings of Jesus, just maybe you're not encountering the Jesus of the Bible. The teachings of Jesus have always been countercultural and, dare I say, uncomfortable. If you're looking for Jesus to be a good teacher to make you comfortable, you might be looking in the wrong place. The second dimension that we see here in this passage in John chapter 20 is Jesus as master. The Greek word here is kurios. It's used a lot in the New Testament, 687 times in the New Testament, as a matter of fact. In John chapter 20, just in these verses we've read, the word is used six different times in verse 2, 13, 15, 18, 25, and 28. It can mean a, a, a wide scope of things. It can be a simple term of reverence. In fact, we see that in verse 15. She turns to the man who she thinks is the gardener and she says, Kurios, sir. Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him. It can be a simple term of reverence or respect. But at its heart, it really means Lord, ruler, prince, or the one who governs or rules. But it's also the term that was used to designate the Messiah that the Jewish people were waiting for. And we see his disciples and followers revering him as the Messiah from early on. In John chapter 1, at the calling of his first disciples, Andrew is drawn in as a disciple of Jesus, and then he runs to tell his brother Peter, Come, we've found the Messiah. The Samaritan woman that we examined a, a, a couple of weeks ago in John chapter 4, she, she ran into the people of her town and she said, come and meet a man who told me everything I've ever done. Could this be the Messiah? 
And in John 11, Martha declares, before Jesus raises her brother from the dead, she says, yes, Lord, I believe you are the Christ, the Messiah. In fact, she uses both terms there. Yes, Lord, kurios. I believe you are the Christ, the Messiah. Jesus as Master, Lord. Brings with it two challenges as well. The first challenge is to the political establishment. If Jesus is Lord, then Caesar is not. If Jesus is is Lord, then Caesar is not Lord. And that is why the early Christian church was such a threat to the empire of Rome. Because they demanded allegiance to Caesar as Lord. And the Christians said, no, there's only one who deserves, who is worthy of that title. And that is Jesus Christ, our kurios, our Lord. It was a challenge, direct challenge to the political establishment. But it was also, as we saw last week, a direct challenge to the people's expectations. Many longed for a Messiah to rescue them from this political slavery. And Jesus came as a humble servant. Do you call Jesus your Lord? Is he the master of every area of your life? Is he the ruler of your personal political establishment? Has he unseated self on the throne of your heart and taken up full residence within you? A genuine encounter with the risen Jesus should affect every area of my life. How about your personal expectations? of life and your pursuits and how you define success. Is Jesus your kurios? Or is he just a curiosity that you dabble with on the weekends? Jesus as teacher. Jesus as master. And finally we see Jesus as God. Look at verse 28. I'm actually going to back up to 24. But Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples were saying to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I shall see his hands and the imprint of his nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again, his disciples were inside and Thomas was with them. And Jesus Jesus came, the doors having been shut and stood there in, its midst, in, his, in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, reach here your finger and see my hands. Reach here your hand and put it into my side and do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. This is the Greek word theos. All of the disciples ultimately came to this conviction, including John, the author of our gospel here. In fact, he opens his gospel with the statement, 
In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, Theos, and the Word was God, Theos. We know this is a reference to Jesus because a few verses later he says, And the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. But John wasn't the first to recognize it. Peter came close when Jesus asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And then he said, But who do you say that I am? And Peter responds, You are the Christ, the Messiah, Lord, the Son of the living God which is quite true. And Jesus commends Peter for the insight that the Spirit of God had given him. But it's not quite yet recognizing Jesus as theos, like in the beginning, God. No, it was doubting Thomas. What a poor historical moniker to bear for eternity. I mean, really, all the disciples had the same reaction when Mary came running in and said, I have seen the Lord. In fact, Mark 16, chapter 10 says, they all refused to believe her. They all had the same reaction. But only Thomas gets saddled with the naysaying nickname. And yet, on close examination of the text, we see that Thomas was actually the first disciple to comprehend and declare Jesus is God. And this brings its own challenges in their context, and in our lives as well. First of all, it's a direct challenge to the establishment theology. It was a direct affront to Rome's polytheism and the many gods that were worshipped. Caesar, yes, but many other gods in Greek and Roman culture. And the Christian claim is that none of those are gods. Jesus Christ alone is God. And it was a direct challenge to the establishment theology of the Jewish understanding of monotheism. The Trinity upsets everybody's apple carts. It was a challenge to the establishment's theology. It was also a challenge to the establishment's eschatology. Eschatology is the belief and study about what will happen in the end times, the study of end things. And the Jews were expecting a Messiah, but in the Old Testament, there's no clear consolidated belief system that this coming Messiah would in fact be divine or that God himself would personally intervene directly in human history. So the fact that Jesus is both Messiah and God was a direct affront to the establishment's eschatology. Teacher, Master, and God. The three dimensions of essential worship. Is Jesus your teacher? Is he the one you go to first? Is he your source of truth? Do you, like Peter, say, To whom else can I go? For you, Jesus, alone have the words of eternal life. Is Jesus your teacher? 
Is Jesus your master, your Lord? You see, Jesus came, took the form of a humble servant, yes. But he never abandoned his rightful place as Lord and sovereign. This is why he is called the King of kings and the Lord of lords because he is the creator of all things and his rightful place in your life and in mine is that of Lord and King and Sovereign. And Jesus as God Of all of these words, the final word that drives this home to me is a three letter word found in Thomas's declaration. And that's the Greek word mu. He says, My Lord and my God. The Greek word for my is mu. My Lord and my God. Not only does Thomas surely recognize Jesus as a great teacher, and he recognizes him as Lord and acknowledges him as God, but also Thomas embraces him as his teacher and his sovereign Lord and his God. Dear friends, don't be satisfied with an academic understanding of Bible truth. I pray that you study the Bible and dig deep, but don't be satisfied with an academic understanding. Press into the heart of the Father in the person of Jesus Christ and in the power of His Holy Spirit and embrace Jesus as your teacher and as your Lord and as your God. May this Resurrection Sunday be your Resurrection Day and a day of new beginnings for you. He is not dead. Behold, he lives forevermore. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, what an honor it is to be able to celebrate with one another, with Christians who gather around the world today to celebrate our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, our great teacher, our great Lord and Master, and our great God. We opened up today by reading Revelations chapter 5, 4, and 5. Why? Because there in the end we shall see you in all of your glory. Worthy, worthy are you, Lord, to receive all glory and honor and power and praise. Today we are called to worship you in spirit and in truth. In that day we shall see you face to face and we will worship you in person and in truth. United together as believers from every tribe and nation and tongue and language and people. 
and raising with one voice. Glory be to God. To him who sits on the throne and unto the Lamb. Be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. May this day begin a new journey for you in essential worship of our teacher, our master, our God, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Hey, thanks for joining us today here at Millard Alliance Church in Omaha, Nebraska. At MAC, we are passionate about encountering God, encouraging one another, and engaging the world with the love of Jesus Christ. If Millard Alliance is your church home, whether online or in person, you can continue your giving at millardalliance.com giving. Be sure to like and follow our Facebook page at Millard Alliance and share with all your friends. We pray today that you have encountered God through worship in the word, that you've been encouraged in your walk of faith, and that you are inspired to be a blessing as you have been blessed. And now, back to Pastor Sean. Thank you, Eric, and thank you all again for joining us today. If you're part of our local congregation, be sure to connect with us in our prayer and praise Zoom call immediately following the service. You can find the link for that on our Mac family private group. Have a blessed Resurrection Sunday. And now Caleb is going to close us out with a benediction this morning. I'm going to close our service this morning with a blessing from number six. And I just ask as you listen to these words that you pray them in your heart and claim them for yourself. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. His peace. He is the Prince of Peace. May the Lord give you peace.